Bruce Springsteen was here, Elton John was here. Barry Manilow had, I mean, he just had the best voice. It really is a magnet to Carbondale. Just the party environment that, that the university had at that time. I mean, we just had, we had a lot of fun. This was where people from around the whole region came to get their entertainment. It was so exciting, everything that was happening. Hey Salukis, I'm Jeff Gleam with the SIU Alumni Association. And welcome to another edition of Saluki Sleuths. In this episode, we're gonna take a look back at the history of concerts at the SIU Arena, now known as the Banterra Center. Here's Anna Toomey with more. Cheering crowds, camping out for tickets, checking the marquee for the next show. Concert-loving Salukis know all too well. The SIU Arena rocked. You know, there was always rumors about what was coming to the arena, right? And then the rumors would start. Sometimes they were right, sometimes they were wrong. You can't really beat the excitement and enthusiasm of a, you know, a live rock show happening. And, uh, you know, students would really get into it. Construction on the arena began in 1962, and it was finished in 1964. One of the very first concerts was the Dave Brubeck Quartet, the beginning of a long list of acts that would feature the most prominent musicians in America. Elvis, Sonny and Cher, Bon Jovi, Bob Dylan, Johnny Cash. So one of the concerts I went to at the arena was in the spring of 1990. It was White Snake, and I believe the opening act was Bad English. Barry Manilow had, I mean, he just had the best voice, and he was center stage. Most of the concerts at the arena were uh, set up on one end of the arena, but Barry Manilow was actually a center stage concert, and so the stage spun, not fast, but it, would, it spun while he was playing. Ask any 80s, 90s, or early 2000s Saluki grad about their concert experience. They'll tell you just how good a time it was. I think, particularly for students who graduated in the 70s, 80s, 90s, maybe even early 2000s, concerts at the Banterra Center or the arena are a big part of their Saluki memories. I mean, I can I remember seeing REO Speedwagon in you know the spring of 1988. Les O'Dell is a multimedia journalist at the Southern Illinoisan newspaper in Carbondale. He graduated from SIU in 1988 and went to his fair share of arena concerts. Les made it his mission to compile a comprehensive list of every show that has ever happened at the arena. And so I wanted to do some research and write a story about you know, basically, will the Banterra Center ever rock again? You know, what happened? Why weren't their concerts being booked as regularly as they used to be? What's happened and what's the future hold for, for music at that venue? One of my first steps was to try to find a list of acts that had been in the arena um, since the building opened in the, in the early or mid 1960s. And come to find out there really wasn't a decent comprehensive list of all the touring acts that had performed in the building. Les started at Morris Library Special Collections, the department that maintains photos and videos of concerts at the arena. Special Collections had a partial list, so Les also did some searching online. So I spent a number of months um, kind of researching uh, touring acts, bands, concerts, special events that they'd had at the building, um, going everywhere from you know that list that we had to archives at the Southern Illinoisan, to old Daily Egyptians, to old obelisk yearbooks. That list now includes more than 300 acts. Throughout his research, it became clear to Les just how much of an impact these concerts had not just on Carbondale, but the Southern Illinois region. And the thing that I found in my work, in my efforts, was when I talked to people about concerts, over and over again, people would say, well, you know, the first time I ever came to Carbondale was to see so-and-so at the arena. They all came to this building, and this was where people from around the whole region came to get their entertainment. It was so exciting, everything that was happening on campus at that time. Scott Moeller is a 1985 SIU grad who worked in the arena promotions department shortly after graduating. So, be so before we had electronic uh, billboards going on out on Route 51, how people got their information was they would drive by the arena and they would look at the marquee to see what was happening on the marquee. So literally I had a form in my office that I filled out that I would write in capital letters what was to go on the marquee. I had four lines and I had so many uh, letters and numbers that I could use. During Scott's time at the arena, things looked a lot different. Well, back in the day when the building was first built, architecturally, you came in through these doors. And these doors weren't just these two doors, it was about six or eight doors that you came in that just opened up into this big lobby space. And when people bought tickets for events, they would come here and these 
boxed in these bricked in or uh, windows were actually ticket windows that, that were where people would buy tickets. So when tickets went on sale for the first day of sales, this is where you came to buy your tickets. At the time, buying concert tickets was an event of its own. People would camp out for days along this pathway right next to the arena just to get a place in line so they could get the best tickets possible. And over time, that became a little bit of a problem with us and went to a lottery system to, to avoid that. But that was the type of excitement that we had. The arena could seat up to 11,000 people. Scott meticulously kept records of stage arrangements and promotions from the 80s. This would be a setup for like an 11,000 seat concert uh, would be in the round. So the performer would play in the round and it, that would accommodate 11,000 seats. And then here would be like more of a typical concert setup, like an Aerosmith or ZZ Top. Preparing for a concert has always been a massive effort. Matt Shackleton is an assistant athletic director for facilities and operations at Banterra Center. He's been with SIU for more than 20 years and started out with University Event Services, a job that involved managing concerts at the arena. But I've been to basically every concert or worked every concert since about 95, 96. Matt takes us on a tour and explains how crews typically get the arena set up for a big concert. So this is the location, obviously, where we'll bring in all of the equipment from the roll-up door there. It will roll out. The stage will be here, uh, kind of where the guys are, are playing basketball, actually just the side of where they're playing basketball. If we're bringing in 18, 21 trucks in here, all of this will be full of road cases that we'll stack up two and three high uh, to get everything in here. Then we'll walk down this hallway here, and this is where all the locker rooms uh, and dressing rooms for our artists are. So this locker room, we can have this, uh, a lot of times this will be the, the whoever the star artist is um, or the headliner. Okay. Um, this would typically be their locker room or their, their dressing room. Uh, we will put black curtains in front of all the lockers just to make it look prettier. Most of them will actually have real specific requests. So some of them will say, hey, we want a couch and a love seat. Some will just say, we want, 10 chairs. If those walls could talk, they would have a lot of stories. When a major artist agrees to play at the arena, they send over a document known as a tech writer. That tech writer specifies what the artist requires to perform. The one, one that kind of is famous, that everybody kind of has heard about, um, and although Diamond Day from Van Halen was the one that started it, um, Steve Tyler also picked it up, that, which is the, the green M&Ms. He wants no green M&Ms in, uh, in his dressing room, but he does want M&Ms uh, in a bowl in his dressing room. And, and uh, it was a wacky request. I mean, not ridiculous, but wacky. Back in the 80s and 90s, a crew of dozens of SIU students were usually responsible for assembling the stage. But when you do this at a university, um, for the most part, we were staffing those events with just student workers. Mark Wettstein spent 16 years as the technical director for concerts at the SIU Arena and Shryock Auditorium during the 80s. He got his start at the arena as a student. But I just never really got an appreciation of the scale of the production and how much was involved in the setup. And then, you know, here it is, you know, my very first concert working and I have to climb the the cable ladder to get up onto the lighting truss and run a follow spot on the, onto the stage. And it was just like, wow. The impact of arena concerts on the region extends farther than some might think. We were always concerned about ticket prices. The ticket prices would be too expensive for students. And then we started doing surveys. And we found out that 80% of the kids that were coming to these big concerts were really from area high schools, you know, from as far away as Mount Vernon, Harrisburg, and down Shawnee Town, and Cape Girardeau, and Sykeston. We always had so many concerts. We knew that we were going to have between four and six or eight concerts in a year. Um, at that time, you know, obviously the community, uh, just the party environment that, that the university had at that time. I mean, we just had, we had a lot of fun and it was a lot of fun to be a part of those concerts. You know, one of the things that I think SIU did a great job of, particularly through the 70s and 80s and 90s, was casting that across all genres. Um, so there was always a show that somebody would enjoy. Well, that wraps up another edition of Saluki Sluice. I hope you really enjoyed this edition. I want to thank our alumni who contributed as well as our university experts to bring all this together to make this happen. I also want to thank Anna Toomey and Caleb Hale for all the work that they put into these episodes. I hope you're enjoying them. Please give us your feedback. We're, we always enjoy hearing from you. And as always, go dogs.